Hello, welcome to Emotional Badass, where Moxie meets Mindful. I'm your host, life coach and psychotherapist, Nikki Eisenhower. And on today's episode, we're getting real to thwart depression. As a tribe of highly sensitive people, many of whom are healing a dysfunctional childhood, there winds up being a very fine line between perfectionism and idealism. As a tribe, we might be a group of people that holds a lot of ideals, which can seem like a good idea because we want to have hope. We want things to be better. And we're certainly all in our own personal ways and maybe our professional ways working for the world to be better, for us to be better to each other. Too much idealism seems to set up expectations of perfectionism. And what we know is that much of our discomfort, much of our anxiety, much of our depression comes from this creation of expectation that the human psyche loves to do. We can see this in our young people with depression rates skyrocketing. So this episode is about getting real to thwart depression, to keep depression at bay. Our perfectionism is very sneaky. You know, it doesn't expect things like perfect weather It creates expectation for things that sound kind of reasonable. And I hope that today's episode helps you unravel some idealism that may be sneaking into your consciousness. I am about getting real. I am about dealing with what is. Because I know in my own life, being too idealistic, even expecting there to be a time in my life where things get easy is a certain kind of idealism. So this is a list. I have 14 things for you that we can get real about. And as always, take what works for you and leave the rest. All right, so this is a biggie. I'm just gonna start with this one out of the gate. And I'm just gonna say what it is that I want us to get real about. Older people dying is natural and the order of things. Now, every single one of us if we're not a very small child, knows this. If I sent out some kind of magical quiz to everyone that was listening, all of you would go, yes, 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 I know this. But there's a sneaky kind of idealism that I keep seeing growing with more and more people differently than 10 or 15 years ago in my career. When we're not dealing with this reality, When we're not prepping ourselves for the naturalness of death, whether that's with our pets that have a much shorter lifespan than we do, whether that's with aging parents or aunts and uncles or even friends, we're not really setting ourselves up to be successful with this inevitability of people dying over the course of our lifetime. So what I can suggest to get real about this is to let go of ever telling yourself anything that sounds or smells or feels like this. I can't handle somebody dying. I can't handle it. What am I going to do when so-and-so passes? I can't handle my dog and the end of his life. We do this a lot to ourselves, especially as highly sensitive people. What a bad program to keep reinforcing that we can't handle, we can't handle, we can't handle. Imagine what that does to the inner child that's witnessing our grown-up self say, repeat, and reinforce that we can't handle what is absolutely natural. It's an unwise self-talk, an unwise self-hypnosis that you can't handle it. What we want to do here is be real about grief. We want to help ourselves feel grief. And as highly sensitive people, we often pre-grieve if we're facing something and dealing with it. But we don't need to be shocked when people have lived a very long life or pets have lived a very long life and they are at the end of it. 
We want to learn how to be sad and honor their life and our grief for losing their human or their pet form. But we don't need to add a layer of shock and disbelief to the process of letting the human body go. All right, number two. And these are not mutually exclusive, so this one overlaps what I just said. But every human being can handle difficult, heartbreaking things. Now, this is tricky because how do we teach people this? Parents, how do you teach this to kids? How do we hold this space for our friends when they think that they can't handle a difficult thing? Our loved ones, our siblings, our cousins, our neighbors, our communities. How do we teach people that they really can handle difficult, heartbreaking things without intentionally walking up and crushing somebody's heart and then going, see, you lived through that. We don't want to be that person, right? That's not going to work. What we can do is we can use this life if we're raising small children, if we have small children in our lives, we can use the age appropriate milestones like tying shoes or riding a bike or enduring a failing grade with personal responsibility. We use these life experiences, these moments to really reinforce, wow, that was tough. Look at what you did. Or if someone is going through an emotionally hard time, maybe their first breakup through adolescence or early 20s of their first love, to be able to say, I know that you are hurting. You are hurting more than you have ever hurt before. And it feels like you're going to die, but you're not. Every human has felt that. Look how strong you are for even having your tears and allowing your pain. What would happen if we related to people in such a way, if we had people relate to us in such ways, we might have more confidence as we navigate this messy and uncomfortable human experience of life. We can do so much for ourselves and each other to put on lenses of strength. And when we see the strength, wow, I'm still breathing. Wow, I woke up another day. I don't know how I'm going to get through this, but I can do the simple things. I can brush my teeth. I can get dressed. The more that we look to our strengths and feed our strengths, the stronger we become. Each challenge in this way that life gives our heart, we get the experience of seeing ourselves live through it. And this makes us believe in our own capacity for resiliency, for strength, for endurance. This is why spiritually we go through hard things and that's a choice to believe in. It's quite depressing to not have that sort of spiritual connection when hard things happen. When we have that kind of spiritual connection, we can meet those hard things with an essence, with a mood, with a leaning in quality that says, I trust on some level that this is going to teach me something about myself, about the world, about life, about people, instead of that old tape of I can't handle it, we really, really can. Number three, each individual human being is in absolute full control of very, very little in this life. I mean, what do we really control, y'all? Not that much when you really look at it. Sure, I can control setting an alarm on my phone, but if that phone malfunctions at night, that didn't do much for me. We can only control our career path so much and we pivot, we make changes along the way because life is a co-creation. We have our ideas, we have our goals, we have our inclinations, our desires, our hunches, and we have our plans but we don't get to fully control all of the factors. So when we try to control all the factors, we often wind up feeling more and more and more out of control because it's as if life shows up going, yeah, you think you control this. It's a co-creation. You are to be guided. One of my sayings that I believe that I needed to hold on to for a while is that I didn't get to choose the lessons. 
I don't get to choose the lessons. And the more that I allow that life is showing me lessons as a way of being, as a value system, as a mindset, as I move through the world, the more control I feel over my being. When we lose it about anything, there's some kind of element of some kind of control that we expected to have that we didn't get to have. One of the things that happened recently to me and my sweet husband is in traveling back and forth between our old place and our new place as we move, an entire bottle of maple syrup opened and turned over in the back of our car. I've never seen anything like it. Wiping it up, it was like inches of maple syrup. Now, old me would have seen that and flipped out. I would have felt victimized, like life is coming after me, trying to do wrong things to me, that despite my best efforts, life is just giving me the finger and I have to stop my life. I have to stop what I planned for the day and attend to this mess. Is life always going to be about attending to mess? And I would fight the moment. What's beneath that fight is that expectation of, I should be able to control these factors. This thing that happened to me, this mundane, random life thing of the stickiest, worst substance in the back of my car that could have possibly happened. I should have been able to control that. And then shame sets in. If I really was a good person, I would have been able to control that. And this is why we fight these types of moments in life from practicing everything that I try to model and talk about with you on the show, I could meet that maple syrup with, ooh, all right, here we go, and roll with it and be peaceful and genuinely not angry or not upset. As I started cleaning it up, I was saying to myself, this is so fixable. I'm so glad that this problem that dropped at my doorstep is a fixable, manageable easy thing. No one is hurt. No one is damaged. This is completely fixable. Isn't that lovely? And to be able to not just say that, because on the journey, there were times when I was saying the right things to myself, but my body was feeling level 12 activated. And that's just the difference between head knowledge and heart knowledge. When you practice positive mindset, when you practice letting go, when you practice helping your inner child grow up and get what he or she needs so that she doesn't have to have tantrums anymore, it all starts to come together. And as that head knowledge becomes heart knowledge, becomes body knowledge, you actually start to be able to feel the peace and the wisdom of the words and the language that are coming from the mind that you have worked so hard to reprogram. Because those old trauma programs are so full of darkness and heaviness and shame and basically just wrong-minded stuff that digs our depression hole deeper. The most control that I've been able to feel in my life comes from letting go of this idealized control. And then I can flow. I can laugh when life sends me not just a lesson, but I knew in that maple syrup moment that the universe wasn't trying to make me have a bad day. The way I received that is the universe going, you know what, Nikki? You just get to strengthen that letting go muscle right now. You get to strengthen that. This gets to feel as easy as it can possibly feel, even in the face of something you didn't want. That's how we find more beauty in the life moments that aren't just massive wins for us. I don't have it on my list, but that's kind of another idealized expectation that if we're doing life right, we will always be winning instead of realizing that for the wins to really feel wonderful, they can't be constant. We'd grow bored of them. We wouldn't appreciate them. All right. Number four, being alive is uncomfortable. There seems to be a growing expectation, particularly in our youth, that we are entitled to a certain amount of comfort in this life. And if we look back at evolutionary biology, evolutionary psychology, how we have developed as a human tribe, 
When has it ever been easy? We have been growing food. We've been fighting each other and surviving. We've fought predators. In more modern times, poor work conditions, health struggles, different diseases. We've thought certain things like, I can't think of what the name of it is right now, but things that they used to put in old time watches, disfigured people killed them. The human condition is in figuring things out and trying to get to greater and greater security and ease. But we are always going to have elements of struggle. Life is struggle. Look at the human birthing process. Look at the animalistic birthings. No birth is this gentle, easy experience. It's intense, even in the easiest of births. There is an intensity. We have intense births. And then if we are seekers, we have intense rebirths. What would it be like to embrace that instead of to fight it? Of course, I want more and more and more comfort in my life. But I also recognize that strange paradox that expecting it and then not getting it moment to moment in that moment creates discomfort. And if all we have is the present moment, that is a poor, wasteful use of that present moment. Being alive is uncomfortable. I can flow with that. I can bring ease to that. I can trust that each uncomfortable moment is strengthening something inside of me or outside of me. I can work with that instead of create this expectation of constant comfort or of more comfort than we're getting. Number five, mindset really is everything. I am big on taking care of my physical body at this point in my life, in my 40s. And I've been on a taking care of my body track for a long time. But what I know is more important than even this physical body is my mental mindset. You know, our bodies can go, you guys. We can lose limbs and still function. We can lose the use of our legs We can even become quadriplegic and be unable to move any of our limbs. At the end of the day, our mindset is so important. It is everything. The reason that many people roll their eyes at mindset work is because so many people are walking around with an inner adolescent as a big part of their psychology. And the inner adolescent goes, ugh, I don't need that positivity crap. It rebels, it resists. So to really have a positive mindset within myself, I had to do a lot of work with my inner adolescent. That inner adolescent rebellious part pushed away so much goodness. That's part of the struggle in healing childhood trauma. It's just like a strange paradox that we have to move through. I had to have a rebellious part. My rebellious part was the part of me that said no more for my family system. It made me leave home at 17. Rebellion is not bad. But if we're continuing to have a rebellious part that pushes away options that might very much serve us, we've got to examine that. We've got to break that down. We've got to work on getting that resistant part in a healthy place. You know, if someone attacks me, I want that resistant part of me, that fighter part of me to come out swinging, kicking, biting, screaming. I will fight dirty, dirty, dirty if somebody tries to hurt me. Rebellion is really good, but we really have to have some internal boundaries and a wise woman or a wise man part of us that steps in to redirect that part. To really not let that rebellious, self-sabotaging part of ourselves take over the bus of our life. If I let that part of me take over, she would drive me to some very bad places. I've been to enough bad places. I don't need to keep going. I want to learn those lessons and never go to that neighborhood again. That's part of how I've learned to be proud of myself and self-respecting. Very hard to be self-respecting proud of ourselves, grow our self-worth if we're still allowing an adolescent 
immature, reactionary, rebellious, screw it. I don't want to try the healthy thing part of ourselves. Make life decisions. Number six, risk is necessary and we all must have a relationship with it. Now, this is one of those things that I think very few people ever talk about with their children. Certainly nobody talked about with me, but so much of life is about being able to healthily risk to start any new relationship. We are risking our vulnerability. To start a new job, to walk into a new place, we are risking being the outsider, not being included. When we make any kind of big purchase, our first home, a car, we are risking. What if we buy a lemon? What if we make the biggest purchase of our life and it doesn't work out? We risk in those big ways and we risk moment to moment. There are risks that we accept so readily without even a second thought. Getting in our cars is one of the riskiest, most dangerous things any of us could ever do. And yet most of us do it every day, multiple times a day, putting our children into those vehicles. And we don't even allow ourselves to consider the risk because if we looked at the risk anymore and frightened ourselves, we might not get in those cars. We've accepted that risk as a society and on the individual level. How do we reparent ourselves to have a healthier relationship with risk? How do we empower our kids, those of you raising parents and our collective kids as a society? How do we help them have a relationship with risk so that they can understand no risk, no reward, but there is dangerous risk and there is well thought out, well calculated risk. There are reasons why we don't just take our entire paycheck and go sit at the casino. There's a reason why we don't take our rent money and go buy scratch off tickets. What do you want your relationship with risk to be? Do you frighten yourself about risks that would be really healthy or do you encourage and empower? The perfectionist can really work havoc here because sometimes our perfectionistic parts want to be able to calculate absolutely no risk and have perfect, super duper safety. And it's not available. This is where we can get stuck in decision making. Because if we can't take a healthy risk, how do we make a decision about going back to school, a decision like having a child or not, a decision like to get married or not, a decision to get a pet or not? How do we make healthy risks? What relationship do you want to have with risk? When we don't allow enough risk, we start to give ourselves the subconscious message that we are very, very delicate and we cannot tolerate any risk at all. This is how people's worlds get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So there's a certain amount of risk that we need to invite in this world to have richness, to have relationships. People who become agoraphobic, those are the people that are scared to leave their apartments or their homes. They don't go outside. And in this time and age where everything can be brought to your doorstep, that's a very dangerous thing. Agoraphobics start to believe in this expectation that I get to feel safe all the time, that the outside world is just too risky and it's safer in here. And in that way, they stop living even if they stay alive. This episode has turned into a long one, so we are going to split it up into a part one and part two. If you would like to listen to part two right now, come join us at the $2 level at patreon.com backslash emotional badass. $5 level people, you're still going to get your exclusive August episode. This episode isn't it. This is just an early release. We'll release part two right here on the iTunes feed for our next week's episode. This is a great time to join the Patreon. Right now in August, you can vote for the next Pay It Forward. We give 10% of what our Patreon brings in forward. We pay it forward. We've been doing that since the very beginning, and I haven't done it in a while. So we have $2,300 to vote on as a community and right now we are voting on Raising Men and Women Lawn Care Service. 
This is a fantastic organization, as is Let Grow. If you didn't catch the episode where I talked about these two amazing organizations and what they're doing for our children and our youth to help them build confidence, you can go listen to that episode or you can come to the Patreon and find out more. We'll announce the winner of the next Patreon Pay It Forward in September. You also have voted at Patreon for the next live stream Q&A in August. The vote is now closed. We were voting on body, sex, or spirituality, and y'all voted for sex. So you can come ask me a question about anything, your sexual development, how what happened to you in childhood, or how what didn't happen to you in childhood maybe is affecting you in that department. What goes on relationally? What is it like to recover from childhood sexual abuse? You're welcome to ask any question about vulnerability and intimacy Whatever fits into that topic, you are welcome to ask. You can also still get our Patreon code for the Boundaries course. We're going to blink and it is going to be here. We're about two months out. I look forward to it every year. That's where I really get to put my teacher hat on. And coming to the live streams at Patreon, that's a great little bitty shot, a little bitty taste of how I might be different than this voice on the microphone that you listen to on a podcast And what happens energetically to me is I put on that teacher's hat. You'll be able to see at a live stream Q&A that generally happens the second Wednesday of the month. But that's a great place to feel out my energy and see if if you want to learn in that group format. I have a lot of fun. We have a lot of heart. We tend to have a lot of tears too, sometimes, sometimes happy, sometimes sad. All of you are highly sensitive And part of growing into who we are is learning how to accept our vulnerability and finding other people that feel on a deep level to learn next to and with is quite the beautiful experience. Those of you who have already signed up, I can't wait to meet you. Those of you who have signed up for your second or third year, I can't wait to see you again. I'm an emotional badass. You're an emotional badass. And together we are where Moxie meets Mindful light and love. And I'll see you right here next time. Bye-bye.